Welcome to the University of Maine's annual Mitchell Lecture on Sustainability. My name is David Hart. I'm the leader of the Sustainability Solutions Initiative, or SSI for short. And I'm also the director of the Senator George J. Mitchell Center, which is the headquarters for SSI. I know that some of you are familiar with SSI, but for those of you who aren't, it's an innovative program in which interdisciplinary teams of faculty and students from universities and colleges all around the state are working to help Maine communities solve urgent problems at the intersection of economic, social, and environmental issues. From Fort Kent to Kittery, SSI is working to help balance economic development with natural resources protection in local towns, develop alternative energy in ways that respond to community needs and environmental concerns, strengthen the capacity of communities to cope with extreme floods, improve transportation planning, and prepare for the arrival of insect pests that threaten forests and livelihoods. In these and many other partnerships, SSI go SSI's goal is nothing less than linking knowledge with action to create a brighter future. That's an un unconventional goal for a research project and it's matched by SSI's unusual approach. SSI teams are collaborating with citizens and stakeholders in a shared process of identifying the problems and developing the solutions. This two-way exchange between researchers and stakeholders helps produce a better understanding of the problems and a greater likelihood of solving them. We're very fortunate to have Senator Mitchell and Dr. Jane Lubchenco with us today to talk about the challenges and opportunities involved in tackling these kinds of sustainability challenges. UMaine's president, Paul Ferguson, had also hoped to be here, but he's in Oregon today, participating in a meeting of university presidents focused on sustainability challenges. So I think it's safe to say that he's with us here in spirit. Before I introduce Dr. Lubchenko, I want to make, uh, mention a few details and say a few thank yous. The lecture is being recorded by MPBN's Speaking in Maine series. Following the lecture, there'll be a reception just that way with lots of great food in the grand foyer of the Collins Center for the Arts. So a short walk from here and I hope you can join us. I'd like to thank several sponsors for their support of this year's Mitchell Lecture, including the Mitchell Center itself, the Sustainability Solutions Initiative, Maine Sea Grant, the School of Marine Sciences, the National Science Foundation, which, by the way, awarded uh, SSI a $20 million grant, the largest in NSF's history for research in the emerging field of sustainability science. I also want to thank the Maine EPSCOR office. I'd especially like to express my deep appreciation to the entire staff of the Mitchell Center for all their, their help in organizing this event. Day in and day out, this remarkable group demonstrates what great teamwork is all about. As the leader of SSI, I have the great pleasure of working with an extraordinary group of colleagues. So if you're one of the 200 plus members of this team, whether faculty, undergraduates, graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, high school students, SSI staff, external partners, members of our advisory board, uh, or you just happen to have one of our messy t-shirts, please stand up. As you can see, SSI isn't just one of the nation's most innovative, solutions-focused sustainability research projects. It's a main grown wicked good social movement. <laughs> Speaking of wicked good, let me tell you a bit about our speaker today. Jane Lubchenko grew up right at the ocean's edge in Colorado. <laughs> Strictly speaking, there hasn't been an ocean in Colorado for more than 50 million years. But given the inexorable way that Jane was drawn to the sea, I'm convinced that she heard paleo waves crashing along Colorado's front range as a child. Despite being landlocked, uh, her early life was busy and full. The oldest of six sisters, she was a great student and active in sports, Girl Scouts, and outdoor recreation. 
Jane and her sisters were raised with a strong heritage of empowerment. After all, their paternal grandmother had completed medical school at the University of North Carolina in 1912. While majoring in biology at Colorado College, Jane took a summer course at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, and as they say, the rest is history, or perhaps her story. She was bitten by the marine biology bug, and she's never been the same. Jane went on to do graduate work focused on the ecology of the Rocky Intertidal Zone and was immersed, both literally and figuratively, in some of the world's most intellectually productive waters at the University of Washington, the University of California at Santa Barbara, and Harvard. Her dissertation research, conducted, by the way, right along Maine's coast, the Gulf of Maine, helped revolutionize the way that ecologists think about and study complex interactions among species. She could have easily devoted her entire career to this scientific frontier, but she began to encounter warning signs of accelerating environmental degradation caused by human activities and saw how this could threaten the very life support systems that are essential for the well-being of the entire planet. Since that time, Jane has embarked on an extraordinary journey to mobilize the world's scientific community to help understand and solve pressing sustainability problems. More than 15 years ago, while serving as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the world's largest scientific society, she boldly called for a new social contract for science, one in which science is aligned much more closely with society's most urgent needs. Jane didn't just call for more engaged and responsive science, she incre created entire new organizations to put the plan into action. For example, when she experienced firsthand the challenges involved in helping the public and decision makers understand complex scientific issues, she launched a highly acclaimed training program, the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program, to help scientists gain valuable communication and leadership skills. And in 2009, she went to Washington to lead the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Talk about linking scientific knowledge with societal action. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane Lubchenco to the University of Maine. Thank you everyone for that warm welcome. Thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. It is so nice, so refreshing to have a knowledgeable, accurate, uh, and different introduction. Uh, I appreciate the time that you took to do that. And Senator Mitchell, what an honor it is to be here today. Uh, I've had such admiration for you and your career, and it's a very special treat for me to be invited to give this lecture named in your honor. Uh, the time that I, I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for your sustained engagement uh, and for all the things that you've done to make the world a better place. Uh, it's better because of your wisdom, uh, your creative problem solving, your ability to listen uh, and to find new paths forward. And I am pleased that this community obviously recognizes uh, what a major force you've been. But my personal thanks to you as well. Please join me in thanking the senator. Thank you. Today I'm going to offer some reflections about achieving sustainable solutions that incorporate both the perspectives of an academic scientist and a public service servant based uh, in large part on uh, oceans and on my four years uh, as NOAA administrator. Uh, I warn you from the outset, this will be a non-traditional talk for a scientist. I'm going to tell you some stories, which I know is not considered to be very scientific. But I was impressed in the time that I spent in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the 
important information that is often communicated by stories. You've all heard your members of Congress, the President, other elected officials tell stories when they want to illustrate a point. And people like stories. They like to hear about other people. And social scientists tell us that stories are particularly memorable. They call them sticky uh, because we identify with them. We like to hear about them. Um, but I do want to note that the stories I'm going to tell you are true stories, even though you might suspect otherwise. So I'm a marine scientist. I'm going to give you some context before I launch into the, some of these. I'm a marine scientist, as David has said. I've worked at the twin intersections of science and public policy and science and public understanding for a number of years. And my perspective uh, <clears throat> is also colored uh, by, by being a scientist. And so I want to begin by just laying out uh, what I see as the role of science and the role of scientists in our society. If you ask members of Congress what they see as the role of science, why should they fund science, for example, they will often point to the importance of solving health problems, of uh, creating engines for economic growth, of being the first nation to go to the moon or whatever. Uh, but I think a very important role of science that is often not articulated but is vitally important is the role of science in informing our understanding and our decisions. Whether those decisions are made by individuals or by institutions, they will be better if they are informed by science. Now I use that language judiciously because I don't think it's appropriate for science to dictate decisions, but it should inform them. When a member of Congress, for example, makes uh, decisions to vote or something else, he or she will likely take into consideration a number of different things, values, politics, economics. Uh, but my point is science should also be at the table. Now it often is not at the table, in part because it's not understood or it's not accessible. And I think the burden to make it more understandable, make it relevant, make it credible, and accessible is squarely on the shoulders of scientists. And there is an urgent need for scientists to become better at being able to make their science more available, more interesting, share their passion, share their stories. I think that the role of scientists then is to do more than just discover knowledge but also to communicate it more effectively and to generate in ways that are credible. So for example, I often tell scientists I think it's really important for them to become bilingual. And by that I mean being able to speak the language of scientists, of science so they can communicate with other scientists, but be able to speak the language of lay people so that they can communicate in non-technical, non-jargon uh, ways uh, and make the products of their new discoveries more accessible, more understandable. Scientists need to partner with other disciplines and engage with users of information, whether it is just explaining uh, or listening to what users want or co-generating new knowledge. I've been fortunate to witness a quiet revolution within the academic community over the past about two decades or so uh, that I think is a recognition <clears throat> that the world that we live in is changing rapidly. That the applied basic science paradigm that many of us grew up with no longer describes the real world. That there are opportunities for scientists to do cutting edge, really exciting science that is also immediately relevant to society. Uh, what Donald Stokes would call use-inspired science. And in particular, we've seen the emergence of sustainability science, thanks in part to people like Bob Cates, who is with us today, uh, driven by the passion to help address wicked problems that challenge society, uh, wicked problems like using the planet without using it up, 
uh, living sustainably, providing basic necessities for a growing human population while also restoring the life support systems that are essential for all of life on Earth. Now in this broader context of sustainability science <clears throat> and communication of science, uh, my particular focus has been on oceans. And I want to tee up for you some of the work that had been done before I went to NOAA so that I can better have you appreciate some of the great progress that we have made in addressing some ocean issues uh, as a result of a sustained engagement of a number of different people. So I'm going to start in uh, about the year 2000 with the creation of the Pew Oceans Commission, which was uh, charged with reviewing U.S. policies and practices in oceans. The Pew Oceans Commission was composed of quite a few, three, four former governors, mayor, um, commercial and recreational fishermen, including Pat White, who at the time was the CEO of Maine Lobstermen's Association, a number of philanthropists, educators, scientists, business people, all coming together <clears throat> to essentially embark on a voyage of discovery by going around the country, <clears throat> not just <clears throat> excuse me, not just coastal areas, but the heartland as well. Uh, listening, learning, having experts talk about uh, what they knew, and those experts were scientists as well as fishermen or local uh, community leaders. Uh, a joint voyage of discovery that resulted in some startling findings, startling for people who hadn't really been paying attention. Um, so these findings were really based on both science and personal experiences. And essentially, just to summarize the big picture, they concluded that uh, the oceans, especially uh, with, a, with a focus especially on U.S. waters, uh, there was increasing depletion and disruption of oceans, uh, that there are, is increase in bleached corals, increase in number and size of dead zones, depleted fisheries, uh, more, stressed, more stress on many species, loss of habitat and biodiversity. And Leon Panetta, who was the chair of this Pew Oceans Commission, listened to all of this and gave what I thought was a very insightful analysis. He said, you know, there are really two things going on here. One is a failure of perspective, by which he meant a failure of understanding. Most people in this country, half of whom who live on the coastal areas, the other half often go there to play, and lots of people like seafood, most of those people were unaware of what was happening. So a failure of perspective. Equally importantly, Leanne said, was a failure of governance. That those elected officials uh, and those responsible for managing a wide variety of activities that affect oceans had really not been stepping up to the plate and doing their job. Leon continued to say that in his experience, change in the United States happens by one of two ways, either by crisis or by leadership. And he said, oceans are clearly in a state of crisis even though no one knows it, so we urgently need both stronger leadership and broader public awareness. And I thought that was very uh, insightful and really guided a lot of what the commission did. We issued a series of recommendations based on science and based on experience, <clears throat> including uh, develop a new shared vision of oceans with stewardship front and center. Uh, the message that healthy oceans matter was sort of the encapsulation of that to connect the dots between healthy oceans, healthy coastal communities, healthy coastal economies, to integrate much better across the federal agencies that are involved in oceans in one way or another. There are about a dozen agencies that deal with something that affects oceans. More than 140 different 
uh, federal laws and regulations. And they're, it's just a hodgepodge assemblage of things. So it had been managed sort of issue by issue, crisis by crisis, without much cohesion. We also strongly recommended strengthening regional mechanisms of coordination and smart planning. The need to manage fisheries sustainably and have sustainable aquaculture and a bunch of other things. So that was sort of the report that was issued 10 years ago now, 2003. And we launched into efforts to share this report and to uh, create increasing momentum for implementing some of the recommendations that we had made. And we had many interesting conversations with lots of different individuals. But one that really stood out for me was a conversation I had with Senator uh, Dick Luger. Uh, and he uh, is not from a coastal state, but he stood up at the press conference where Congress formally received the Pew Oceans report from the commissioners. And he said to folks, I'm here today because I live in a coastal state. And people thought, boy, he doesn't know his geography very well. He's, he's, you know, is he losing it? And he said, I learned from interacting with these commissioners and reading the report that every state is a coastal state. We all benefit from oceans, we all contribute to the problems in oceans, and we all need to be part of the solution. There was a second commission, the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy, that got underway, formally constituted by Congress and by, uh, appointed by the President, that had a very similar voyage of discovery, very similar findings, very similar recommendations reported out a year after. And the two commissions joined forces to help work to implement the solutions. And some very wise individuals, for example, Bill Ruckelshaus, who was the first administrator of EPA, uh, and he served on the U.S. Commission, he uh, had the bright idea of creating an annual report card that this joint group of commissioners would issue to evaluate the progress that was, had been made uh, on the recommendations. So that was sort of in motion, trying to educate people, gain some momentum, gain more champions for oceans. Uh, <clears throat> but the reality was, both within Congress as well as the administration, uh, post-2003 Pew Report, 2004 U.S. Commission Report, <clears throat> very little progress was being made. Despite attempts by a number of individuals uh, to introduce legislation, to uh, begin implementing some of these recommendations. Uh, fast forward to 2008. Uh, President Obama was uh, elected in uh, November. He decided to really make uh, a series of appointments that brought in scientists in key high positions in his administration. And there were new opportunities to begin looking afresh at some of the issues like uh, ocean issues. I was fortunate to be invited by the President to serve as Under Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Administrator of NOAA. Uh, I was announced as part of the science team that the President created, later known as the Science Dream Team. Uh, and I came to Washington, was confirmed by uh, the U.S. Senate to lead the nation's Ocean Climate and Weather Agency. So NOAA has a very broad portfolio, uh, responsibility for weather forecasts and warnings because, of course, the National Weather Service is part of NOAA. Uh, NOAA keeps climate records and does climate assessments and manages fisheries uh, and uh, is the federal agency that is the real steward of healthy oceans and coasts. All of those depending on good science, which NOAA has and supports. So about a $4 billion federal agency, about 13,000 employees, uh, really amazing people that I felt honored to work with. Turns out that my background 
as a marine biologist was actually really good preparation for working in the political world that is Washington, D.C. Rough and tumble politics. I already knew how to swim with sharks. <laughs> Seriously, knowing how to discern from not just words, but body language and context whether someone, for example, a member of the administration or a member of Congress is just giving you an idle threat versus a very serious threat is very useful information, regardless of whether you're underwater uh, or on the land. Uh, learning how to read those signals and interpret them is actually very, very valuable. So what happened during those four years? Uh, Mariners often have a saying that they uh, offer to one another when they're setting sail. Uh, it says, fair winds and following seas. You know, we wish you luck. That's the best kind of luck. At NOAA, people wished me fair winds and following seas. And I can tell you, we had anything but in the four years that I was there. Some of the challenges that we faced were a seriously dysfunctional Congress, hyperpartisan legislation light, economy in a tailspin, serious politicization of climate science, the Gulf oil spill disaster, Deepwater Horizon. We inherited a legacy satellite, weather satellite program that was a national embarrassment that we had to fix. And we had the most extreme weather in any four years in U.S. history. We had 770 major tornadoes, 70 Atlantic hurricanes, including Irene, Isaac, and Sandy. We had six major floods and three tsunamis. We had historic drought and wildfires, prolonged heat waves, record snowfall, and blizzards. So every single category of weather. We had it in spades. But the amazing team at NOAA and our multiple partners inside uh, the federal government and partners outside really stepped up to the plate and embraced the challenges of delivering, despite all of that craziness, and implementing a very ambitious agenda that we co-created. Nobody, no agency, uh, achieves progress alone. This was really a collective effort. And we delivered a very large number of significant outcomes on multiple fronts, many of which were a direct result of the recommendations of the two oceans commissions. We turned the corner in ending overfishing in US waters. And we are aligning economic and conservation incentives in ways that are truly transforming a number, but not yet all, of U.S. fisheries. We teamed up with the EU to strengthen their fisheries policies and tackle illegal fishing on the high seas. We strengthened science at NOAA and now have policies in place to protect the integrity of science so that it is no longer acceptable to manipulate, to suppress, to cherry pick or to distort the science. Moreover, at NOAA, scientists can speak freely to the media without going through a gatekeeper that might either say, no, you can't talk, or here is your script. So those are big, serious changes that uh, will, I think, serve NOAA well into the future. Uh, and scientific integrity uh, is not something we should take for granted. It has to be actively maintained, and I'm really proud of the progress we made in that front. We also helped create the nation's first national ocean policy that puts stewardship of our oceans front and center. Uh, understanding the importance of observation and monitoring, we fixed this vital weather satellite program that was a national embarrassment. We initiated the most ambitious national climate assessment ever that includes a focus on oceans and ocean acidification. Uh, that's due out in the first quarter of next year, so 2014. 
We accurately forecast the increasingly volatile and extreme weather that occurred, saving countless lives and much more. And we promoted a lot of holistic approaches to restoration, for example, in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Irene, Deepwater Horizon, uh, and as adaptation strategies to climate change and sea level rise. So that's sort of a, a, a big picture summary of some of the challenges and some of our accomplishments. Reflecting on that, now that I've been able to be away from it for a few months, I left in February, um, I'm really struck by a number of lessons learned about uh, theories of change, <clears throat> how change is possible, uh, and the, again, the importance of communicating science, uh, and in so doing, knowing your audience, and using analogies and the right labels to help do that communication. So I want to tell you a few stories about some of those experiences that will illustrate, I think, some of the things that I just said. As one is communicating, it's really important to know, you know, communication is two-way, right? So you need to know where your audience is. And the story that I'm going to tell you is a very serious, was a very serious failure on my part in knowing where my audience was. I described to you earlier the fact that we had weather satellites that we were building. So the ones that are up there in space now currently provide over 90% of the data that go into our weather forecasts. So they're clearly really important. We've got great functional satellites that are up there now. NOAA's in the process of building the next generation to fly when the ones that are up there are no longer functional. We fixed the management problems that uh, was not an easy thing to do, but we fixed that. And then I was on the Hill to talk to members of Congress about the importance of funding these weather satellites that we were building. And I met with one gentleman uh, in the House of Representatives who was on the Armed Services Committee. And I was telling him how important these satellites were, weather satellites. And he looked at me and he said, Doctor, I don't need your weather satellites. I've got the Weather Channel. <laughs> and I thought, oops. Better go back two or three steps, if not 10 or 12, and start all over again and describe uh, where the Weather Channel gets its information. <laughs> so, uh, doctor, I don't need your weather satellites. I have the Weather Channel. That was a classic. Um, another story about communicating science has to do with um, all of this uh, bizarre weather that we've been having and more and more Americans uh, saying what the heck is going on is are we seeing climate change and a lot of people would ask that exact question and this really came to um, really sharply into focus after Hurricane Sandy especially when Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Christie made strong statements about climate uh, the reality is the science of saying that event is caused by this thing, which is the science of attribution, is very complicated. And most, uh, even though we're making good progress in being able to do better with attribution, there's still a long way to go. And I realized that it would be easier to say what I just said to you using an analogy that might make more sense to people. And I was compelled by one that I heard uh, that I will share with you. And that is an analogy with baseball. When a baseball player begins taking steroids, his chance of hitting more home runs and big home runs increases significantly. Now that does not mean that you can point to any particular home run and say, aha, that home run is because of taking steroids. But the pattern is most certainly consistent with taking of steroids. And by analogy, what I think we are seeing is weather on steroids, weather on climate steroids. That doesn't mean that every single extreme event is caused by climate, but the pattern that we are seeing is likely consistent with the increased energy in the system because of uh, climate change. 
Another story about communicating science at this interface, uh, also having to do with climate. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in the period of time since 1998 when we haven't seen a continued increase in global average temperatures, but it's been um, over the last now 15 years, it's been more or less no discernible change. Uh, and I was asked by that repeatedly by members of Congress during hearings. And I would often say 10 years is not, uh, 10 years at the time, was not long enough to detect a trend in a really noisy system. You need a longer record than that. And I wasn't really getting through saying that. Uh, and I, the next member of Congress that asked me about that very thing, I knew was a surfer. And I said to him, Mr. So-and-so, have you ever stood on the beach and watched 10 waves come ashore? Could you tell me based on that whether the tide was going out or coming in? And he said, no, of course not. 10 waves is not long enough. And then he just got quiet. <laughs> And I think he got the connection about natural variability. Now, it's not a perfect analogy, but it made sense to him. And so one of the challenges in communicating science in this very complex world is finding those analogies that help people understand. I was also struck by the differences in how issues like climate change are playing out in Washington versus in other parts of our country. NOAA worked closely with a number of the governor's associations. The Western Governor's Association is a very important one, and they were just being hammered by drought. They came to NOAA and said, please, can't you help us get ahead of the curve and know what's coming at least a few months in advance? We said, sure, we'd be happy to help. Part of what NOAA is supposed to do is create climate services, which is information and data products about uh, climate variability as well as climate change. So anything longer than about two months, I mean two weeks uh, and on out. We created the U.S. Drought Monitor and the National Integrated Drought Information System that turned out to be very helpful to uh, Western states. Western governors came back and said, that was great, we need more. Would you, NOAA, sign an MOU with us to create a broader suite of climate services? I said, yes, we'd be happy to. We think we can be helpful there. Uh, so NOAA signed this MOU. I went out to one of their meetings. We signed an MOU. And I stood uh, to make the announcement at a press conference next to a governor who is a very staunch climate denier. And he had voted for this MOU. And I asked him after the press conference how he could reconcile the fact that he didn't believe that climate change was happening with voting to sign this MOU for climate services. And he said, oh, that's simple. I don't care what we call it, climate, long-term weather. I need information to plan. And that's very practical, it's very real, and to him, that was paramount. And so labels sometimes uh, are interesting things. Uh, and to him, it didn't matter what we called it, he just needed the information. Segwaying now to some of the ocean issues that we dealt with uh, at NOAA, uh, we were able to uh, make very significant progress on a number of ocean issues. Nowhere near as much as is needed, in my view, but because the commissions had done their work, had laid the groundwork, because there were other things in place, uh, we were able to build coalitions within the administration and build on a decade of good science and, and good activist work uh, and uh, deliver uh, to the president recommendations that resulted in creating the nation's first ever national ocean policy, which is actually a huge accomplishment. We're now in the process of beginning to implement that and creating regional councils, re regional governing, uh, I mean regional uh, planning bodies 
uh, is a critically important step because this is not a top-down Washington directive to regions. It's an invitation for regions to develop smart planning and to identify issues that are of paramount interest and to work with feds in implementing it. So it's a very different paradigm for how to work together. And those regional planning bodies are really, really important. Um, ending overfishing, I described the uh, milestone that we uh, achieved in having in place management plans for every single one of the fishery management or fishery, uh, every single uh, federally managed stock, um, and then aligning uh, economic and conservation incentives with some new, new management tools. Um, I've met spent a lot of time with fishermen uh, before I was at NOAA, but also afterward. And uh, quite a few of them uh, have told me that uh, we uh, haven't achieved all the progress we want, but I can finally see light at the end of the tunnel. This is, this is more on the Gulf Coast and on the West Coast uh, than on the East Coast in terms of rebuilding very important stocks. So I think we're making progress, but it's super, super challenging. We have in place a sustainable aquaculture policy now, and we had a major focus on habitat restoration. When NOAA had stimulus dollars, that was one of the big things that we used them for, was to create opportunities to restore coastal and river habitats. Uh, and we learned in the process of doing that that there is very little broad understanding of how important coastal restoration is. It was like pulling teeth to get that money. And yet for every million dollars we spent on habitat restoration, we created at least 17 jobs, which is more than twice the number of jobs created per million dollars by oil and gas and transportation combined. So huge opportunity for immediate employment opportunities, but even more economic benefit as fisheries uh, recover, as recreational opportunities uh, and restoration of a variety of benefits provided by healthy systems can accrue. So I think there's a lot to be proud of there. A lot left to do. A lot of progress is really stymied by special interests, uh, and we desperately need more citizens to be involved. Um, given that three billion people around the world depend on seafood for their primary source of protein, we need to rethink how we think about food security. Most people think about food security and its grains and livestock, maybe. But fisheries are really very front and center when it comes to food security. Smart planning is increasingly important. Uh, but again, special interests uh, are uh, often much more active than others uh, in, in addressing that. So putting all this together, the NOAA team really, uh, I think, did some amazing work in the four years that I was there. I think we had some major successes. We also were able, in a time of downward pressure on everybody's budgets, to grow NOAA's budget from $3.9 billion, which it had been flat the last uh, four years before I went, to $5.4 billion when I left. Um, but I'm interested more in what these experiences say about the theories of change. Um, and here are some preliminary thoughts about that. The arenas in which we made progress were those where we launched efforts early on, the groundwork had been laid, we had very strong partners inside and outside government, we were persistent but flexible, had solid science that was clearly communicated and relevant, and where we could change incentives. And all of those are really necessary. Good science is critical, but it's not sufficient. Diplomacy is really important. And as Madeleine Albright said, the art of diplomacy is to get other people to want what you want. Oftentimes, change requires understanding what 
the problems are with incentives and changing those incentives. And sometimes it takes the alignment of the right people and the right events. So wrangling all of those conditions together to make progress uh, I think is worth thinking about how to do all that. Um, these outcomes and stories should give you sort of a glimpse into life in DC, uh, especially sort of science at the interface of public policy. I would tell you that science can be a very powerful force, but only if it's at the table, if it's relevant, if it's credible and understandable, which unfortunately is all too rare. So I'll end with one quick story uh, about my very first day on the job. Uh, when one is nominated for a presidentially nominated Senate confirmed position, you don't dare go into your office spaces because that would be presumptuous that you might, would, you, were, you would be presuming to be confirmed. So I hadn't been in my office, hadn't met the staff that were there. First day on the job, I was walking around a very nice large office uh, exploring what was where. I opened a door to a uh, semi-private bathroom and I was startled to see on the floor a Norway rat about this big with a pretty long tail and it was wet. <laughs> and I thought, ooh. And the rat kind of looked startled and I'm sure I did. And it darted across the floor, jumped up on the edge of the toilet, and dove into the toilet and disappeared. And I thought, I don't think I'm going to use that toilet. And I was, my staff was just completely freaked out by this, just completely freaked out. Anybody who's been around DC knows there are rats around, so you know, it's not that big deal. But having one in your bathroom is a little different. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to use that toilet. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that nobody had been in that office for five months. And the pipes uh, leading up to the toilet were probably nice and dry. Uh, it was a nice cozy place to hang out, come out and forage. So I figured all I really needed to do was start flushing that toilet multiple times a day, not using it, but just flushing that toilet. And I, after about two weeks, hadn't seen the rat, decided that that probably uh, was no longer a very habitable place for it to be hanging out, and it had probably gone away. Uh, so I started using the bathroom again, and I haven't seen it since. My staff said to me, uh, I don't believe you thought through that. Uh, I, you know, th nobody but a scientist, nobody but a biologist would be that analytical and think through, you know, why was that rat there and how, what can I do to get rid of it? Uh, and this story made the rounds in Washington. It was written up in the gossip column in the Washington Post <laughs> in the loop that Al Kamen did. And they commissioned a cartoon from a New York uh, cartoonist who specializes in animals. And so I have this cartoon of this rat doing a swan dive into my toilet. <laughs> so only a scientist, only a biologist figuring out how to deal with rats. So I've told you stories uh, from sharks to rats and everything in between uh, and would just leave you with these final thoughts. Science does make it into policy, and especially sustainability science, but progress is episodic. It requires sustained and savvy engagement. Uh, science is critical, but it's not sufficient. Effective communication of scientific results is really paramount, but so too are relationships, partnerships, diplomacy, changing incentives, and the right combination of people and events to achieve sustainable solutions. I passionately believe that this is a very critical time for all of humanity. And we need creative new approaches to be solving some of these very, very wicked problems. I think that science has a key role to play, but only in partnership with uh, communities, with elected officials, and with scientists willing to do things that are different. I have great admiration for what SSI is doing. Uh, and thank those of you who have helped bring it to this point and those of you who will help take it to the next level. It's exactly what we need. Thank you all very much.
So we have time for a few questions, and there are a couple SSI staff, Mike Cartouche and Spencer Meyer, with microphones. We want to make sure we get this on the Speaking in Maine recording. So if you have a question, they'll get a microphone to you. Please go ahead. Thank you for... Yep, we can hear you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I'm Michael Evans from Unity College. Uh, science being ignored is certainly a huge part of the problem as you were discussing. One of the other challenges I'm hearing out there is science being uh, overestimated in terms of what it can do. I hear people saying, oh, we don't need to worry about these things. Those scientists will take care of all that and it'll all correct itself thanks to your work. How do we communicate that balance between science being irrelevant and science being all powerful? Science is far from all powerful. And I think that uh, through history, scientists have sort of oversold what they can deliver and what they can promise. And that actually uh, is somewhat problematic. Um, I think honesty and uh, care in talking about what is possible are really important in this arena. You know, when I talk about science to inform decisions, uh, I'm speaking both of uh, an understanding of how the world works, how it's changing, and what the likely consequences of different policy or management choices might be. But you notice I said likely consequences. And I think we often tend to say this is going to happen as opposed to this is more likely than this. And so the way we talk about what we think is down the road and making, there's a real fine line between communicating how certain we are of something uh, and either over or underselling it. And there are dangers in both directions. So it's a hard sweet spot in the middle to reach, but I think we need to continue to strive for that. So often scientists are really focused on the cutting edge of what they do, and they forget to talk about where they all agree on things. And we saw that play out with climate change early on. There was a lot of focus on what we don't know without adequate attention to, yes, what do we all agree on, and then where is the uncertainty and let's work on that. But by the same token, you know, we're not 100% sure of those. So it's, it's a fine balance and it's one that I think we need to strive to achieve. Spencer. Uh, my name is Ron Davis, I'm a biologist. Uh, in what ways would you change science education on the various levels from the uh, kindergarten up through the PhD uh, to uh, both make uh, scientists more effective in communicating their uh, knowledge to the public and to make the public uh, more uh, familiar with science? I believe that the uh, science education that is hands-on, that's inquiry-based, is uh, are exactly the right approaches. Um, that's certainly done more and more today, but it wasn't typical when I was growing up. You know, science was a bunch of facts and figures and memorization, um, not problem solving. So I think the movement that we've seen toward that uh, is very appropriate. I think that having science teachers that are scientists is also important. Uh, I know a lot of, when my kids were growing up, some of their science teachers that were not scientists felt very uncomfortable teaching science and felt uh, they, they would sort of squash kids' questions because they didn't know the answers. And so they didn't want to be put in a position of saying, I don't know something. So having good training for teachers is as important. And then all of the wonderful opportunities for informal science education 
uh, I think are really, really important through zoos, through aquaria, through lots of other, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, other opportunities. The final thought that I would offer is uh, the importance of science writers and science communicators whose job it is to share the excitement, the passion, the stories, the mystery, the discovery. And science writers are increasingly um, threatened species, if you will, uh, especially as our models, our business models for news are changing. It's the science writers who are often let go from publications, uh, newspapers, for example. And so valuing science writers for the critical role they play is as important to sharing scientific information as teaching scientists to be better communicators themselves. I think we're going to have to stop there, but if you have questions for Jane, please come to the reception. She'll be there afterwards. Hang on. Hang on. So, you hold this. Oops. T-shirt, Jane. And let me just say something about what I'm giving to you. So, to thank Jane for coming all this way and providing such great inspiration for our work, I want to present you with a handmade gift from Edgecombe Potters. I don't know how well you can see it there. Cool. A middleless, edgeless serving platter. For those of you who didn't read <laughs> Jane's award-winning 1978 paper from her dissertation that was published in Ecological Monographs, and who besides me read that paper? Come on, let's see it there. Yeah. Uh, the blue mussel, middleless edgeless, was the competitively dominant rocky intertidal species in waved, swept habitats. So, Jane, thank you thank very you. much. Very special. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a step. Just because Jane didn't use very much jargon in her talk doesn't mean she can't write a jargon-filled scientific paper. Trust me. <laughs> it's now my great pleasure to turn the podium over to one of our SSI graduate students, Bridie McGreevy. Bridie grew up in Brownfield, Maine, and was awarded a Mitchell Scholarship to attend Bates College. I'm delighted to say that she will soon complete her interdisciplinary doctoral degree in the field of communication and the minute she's done with her PhD, she will begin a new phase of her professional development as a postdoctoral fellow in the Mitchell Center. She'll be working with a number of SSI faculty as part of a brand new $6 million NSF grant that we received to help solve complex problems connected to the post, uh, pollution related closure of coastal beaches and shell fisheries along the Gulf of Maine. Bridie. Thank you, David, for that introduction. I might need to lower this. I was asked to introduce Senator Mitchell today because I've had the opportunity to share lunch with him twice. And by way of introducing Senator Mitchell, I wanted to share these two lunchtime stories because although they're brief, they say a lot about the kind of work that he fosters in our state. And I really appreciate Dr. Lubchenco creating the space for storytelling on the stage. My first lunch with Senator Mitchell was in 1997, at the end of my senior year in high school. The Mitchell Institute awards scholarships to graduating seniors from public high schools in Maine. And as David mentioned, I was one of the students to receive this award. Since this program began, it has uh, offered scholarships to more than 2,000 students, resulting in more than $10 million of financial support. This is an award based on academic potential, community service and financial need, and it supports students who are going on to pursue higher education within the state. I admit that I don't remember what we had for lunch that day, but I distinctly remember two things about that lunch 16 years ago. I remember the first thing I said to Senator Mitchell, which was, hello. <laughs> but the second and more lasting impression 
was that through the Mitchell Scholars Program, Senator Mitchell demonstrated to me and other Maine students that pursuing education within the state is possible and desirable, and that there are opportunities for civic leadership and a fulfilling career here. The Mitchell Scholars Program works towards keeping students in Maine to strengthen our communities and our economies. And this affirmation was one of a handful of reasons that 16 years later, I'm still here. And I'm not the only one, as more than 90% of Mitchell scholars go on to live and work in Maine. My second lunch with Senator Mitchell was last year at the George Mitchell Center and home of the Sustainability Solutions Initiative, or SSI. Though I had not grown any taller, I had grown quite a bit in terms of my educational career, this time at the opposite end, finishing up a doctorate here at UMaine in communication and journalism. In our first lunch together, I learned that I could stay in Maine and have a productive education and career. And in the second lunch, as Senator Mitchell described the work that he's advanced in Northern Ireland and in the Middle East peace process, uh, he helped SSI students learn from his experiences and think through some of the complex problems on which we're working here, issues related to climate and energy, water and urbanization. It was in this lunch that I realized that no matter where the next step takes me in my life in leadership roles, I can always come back to Maine and share the learning with people working here, as Senator Mitchell so often does, and as he will once again do today. It's my great honor to introduce Senator Mitchell, and I invite you to join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence today, for your support of this great SSI program here at the University of Maine, uh, and for your warm reception. Thank you, Bridie, for your really very kind introduction. It's really gratifying for me to know that your experience as a Mitchell Scholar has played an important role in your life and that has enabled you to acquire knowledge, leadership skills, and that you're deeply committed to Maine. Just last week, uh, I was in Ireland and uh, had a series of uh, public appearances. And in one of the uh, many press interviews I did, I was asked, as I often have been in the past, uh, was the day on which peace was reached in Northern Ireland uh, the best day of your life. And I said diplomatically that it was very important and meaningful to me, but at best it was third. <laughs> the best day really was uh, when I created the scholarship program that Bridie has been part of, uh, which as she indicated, we give out a scholarship each year to a graduate from every high school in Maine. And we're now past 2,000, past $10 million. Many hundreds of our scholars have attended the University of Maine at Orono and other institutions. And I'm pleased to tell you, brilliant as Bridie obviously is, uh, she's representative of a larger group. And it is a great source of gratification for me uh, to be able to travel around this state, to meet young men and women who have gotten an education because of our program and who are contributing so much and I know in the future will contribute even more. So that really was the best day of my life. Now the second day uh, relates to my family, uh, some of whom are here and I uh, want to mention them. I grew up in Waterville. Uh, and with us today are two of my siblings, both of whom are graduates of the University of Maine at Orono, my sister Barbara and my brother Paul. Uh, and, I'd, and with them are two of my sisters-in-law, Pernella and uh, Janet Mitchell. And so I'd like to ask all of them to stand and thank you all for all you've done for me in the past. Now, 
when we were growing up, my brothers, Paul, Johnny, and Robbie, were famous athletes, well known throughout the state. And then I came along and I was not as good an athlete as my brothers. In fact, I was not as good as anybody else's brother. <laughs> so at an early age, I began to be known around town as Johnny Mitchell's kid brother, the one who isn't any good. <laughs> I developed a massive inferiority complex and a highly competitive attitude toward my brothers. And I realized with great difficulty over time that I was never going to be a great athlete, so I had to excel in some other way so that I could surpass them and shift the inferiority from me to them. <laughs> so what was the second greatest day of my life? It was when I was, the day after, I was elected to the United States Senate for the first time, and the Portland paper had a big picture on the front page of me standing at the microphone at the celebration in the ballroom the evening before with my brother Johnny draped all over me. And the caption said, Senator George Mitchell celebrating his upset victory being cheered on by an unidentified supporter. <laughs> Fernando, when you go home tonight, tell the unidentified supporter that I gave him plenty of attention here at this event today. Uh, I, I want to thank David Hart for the outstanding job he's done with the staff here at the university on this sustainability program. Uh, and they have really made this into something meaningful, not just in Maine, uh, but an example for around the country. And I also especially want to express my appreciation to, to Jane Lubchenco, who's traveled all the way from Oregon to come here today, to thank her, who throughout her remarkable career has strengthened the contribution of science to effective decision making in our society. Please join me in thanking David, the staff, and Jane Lubchenco one more time. Now, as you might expect, I speak often in public. I'm speaking at the University of Southern Maine in Portland tomorrow. Uh, and I've heard myself talk so often that really the highlight, usually for me, is the introduction. <laughs> and uh, Bridie, uh, you did a great job. I appreciate it. I may put you on my travel schedule uh, coming up. Uh, there's a danger when almost every day you hear these kinds of nice things said about you, and the risk, of course, is that you begin to believe them. Uh, and so I like to begin by telling a story uh, about introductions uh, and uh, how I was brought back down to earth. After I completed my service in Northern Ireland, which spanned a period of five years, uh, I returned uh, home and wrote a book about my experience, and then I set out across the country to promote sales of the book on its publication. I received a lot of invitations, could only accept a small fraction of them, and I noticed that many of them were from Irish American organizations, and I learned an interesting fact not previously known to me or many people, that in the United States there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> and as I traveled around the country attending these events, there developed an informal competition among those who were introducing me as to who could give the longest, most exaggerated, often most fantastic, frequently ridiculous introductions of me. The proper way for me to have reacted would have been with humility, to urge them to cut it down, to keep it short. I did not react properly. <laughs> I began to start believing this stuff, and I urged them to even greater length. One guy spent 35 minutes introducing me, reciting my entire life, including events of which I had previously been unaware. <coughs> and when he finished, I said to him, you forgot to mention that I got the science award when I graduated from Waterville High School. 
and I wrote notes to the introducers and egged them on, and by the time I got to the last stop, which was at the Stamford, Connecticut Irish American Society, I was very impressed with myself and my head was so swollen I could barely fit in the front door. When I walked in, the first person I encountered was an elderly woman who rushed up to me, very excited, shook my hand vigorously, said to me, I'm so thrilled to meet you. I think you're a great man. You've done so much around the world. She said, I don't live anywhere near here, but I came and drove three and a half hours just to shake your hand to tell you that and to ask you, would you sign my poster? And I said, well, of course I'll sign your poster. I appreciate your kind words. And she handed it to me with a pen, and I looked at it. And I said, before I sign it, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what's that? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> the poster was a big picture of Kissinger. She said, who are you anyway? <laughs> and when I told her, she said, that's terrible. She said, she said, I drove three and a half hours to meet Kissinger, and all I've got is a nobody like you. I said, well, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there was something I could do to make you feel better. And she thought for a moment. She said, well, there is something you can do. I said, what is it? And she leaned forward, pressed her forehead against mine, and in a conspiratorial voice said, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> Would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name to my poster? So I did. And today, somewhere in eastern Connecticut, that signed picture of Kissinger with my, with my writing of signatures hanging on the wall, a constant reminder to me not to take these introductions too seriously. Well, let me say a few serious words. As Jane pointed out, Sustainability challenges arise in many different contexts. They include efforts to improve the management of fisheries, forests, other natural resources, to enhance livability in our cities and towns, to strengthen our energy security, and as Jane also mentioned, to respond to a changing climate. These problems are inherently difficult to solve they require the ability to evaluate complex connections, potential trade-offs between human well-being and protection of the environment, between local and global concerns, and perhaps most important, between present and future needs. It's heartening to see the parallels between the promising strategies mentioned by Jane and the approach being taken by the Sustainability Solutions Initiative here at the University of Maine. More than 100 SSI faculty and several hundred students have committed themselves to working in partnership with the many stakeholders to create a better environmental, social, and economic future here in Maine. The faculty and students have rolled up their sleeves to tackle a wide range of urgent issues that involve coastal zone management, municipal planning, energy security, forestry, climate adaptation, and many others. I commend the SSI team for its emphasis on aligning science more closely with the, seed, with the needs of society and especially with our own main communities. Now more than ever, we need science to help us understand the causes of the problems of sustainability and the options for solving those problems. But science cannot operate in a vacuum. It needs to be part of a broader discussion about our values, our aspirations, and most importantly, the kind of future we want to create for our children and theirs. How can we make decisions that result in a stronger economy, in thriving communities, and at the same time, a healthy environment? How do we balance the need for continuity so essential in every human society, and change so inevitable in every society? How can we ensure that future generations have more opportunities, not fewer? I know the SSI team has begun to have productive conversations, built innovative partnerships with communities, with businesses, with government, nonprofit organizations, and others. And by entering into these relationships with humility, with patience, 
with a genuine desire to learn from the perspectives and experiences of their partners, they're working to create the basis for successful collaboration. In politics and in public service, I've found that trust and mutual respect are among the most important ingredients for making progress in solving any problem. Science's potential contribution to society will be limited unless scientists and science are trusted. Of course, this is easier said than done in a society that is inherently political and increasingly partisan. So I congratulate Jane for her outstanding work, especially to protect the integrity of science, to minimize the potential for political interference. Although it is impossible, of course, in a free and open society to insulate science completely from politics, we need to maximize its credibility and trustworthiness to make it acceptable. And mutual respect and trust are indispensable for all effective partnerships. That often requires competing individuals and institutions to work together toward common goals. There's a natural tendency, which we all share as humans, to become fixated on our preferences, our values, our beliefs, and in turn, to make those into bases for differences with people who have different preferences, different values. And so we have to make certain that personal conflicts are not a barrier to search for solutions. I had to address this challenge directly when I became the Majority Leader of the United States Senate. On the day that I was elected, among the very first persons I called was the Republican Leader of the Senate at the time Bob Dole. I asked if I could come to his office and see him. He said, of course. I went down and I said to him, these are very tough jobs and we cannot succeed if there is no trust between us. So I said to him, I've come to tell you how I intend to behave toward you and to ask you in turn to behave toward me in the same way. And I set out what are really the most simple, basic, fundamental tenets of fairness. I told him first that I would never surprise him. That's a big issue in the Senate. I said, I will always tell you in advance what I'm going to do so you can prepare your response. I told him I would never try to embarrass him, that I would not criticize him personally. And when we disagreed, which I said I know will be often, I'll do the best I can to keep our discussion on the merits. He was delighted. We shook hands, and since then, to this day, not once ever has a harsh word passed between Bob Dole and I, publicly or privately. The lessons I learned in the Senate that day and others are also applicable to the work of SSI, which will inevitably encounter conflicts that are an inherent part of ongoing relationships and collaborative processes. Despite the differences in values, in goals, in objectives, and preferences that are inevitable in any society, especially one as large and diverse as our nation, I believe it's possible to make progress if we can just acknowledge and respect differences among us and not ever make it personal on the other side. I've also learned from experience that efforts like SSI, efforts that seek to create a new vision, a new sense of purpose, that draw together individuals and institutions from diverse backgrounds with different interests, that take risks in the search for innovative solutions. These efforts take time. They encounter setbacks. And the way forward is not always clear. And so even as SSI celebrates its major progress after four years of hard work, everyone, those involved and those observing, needs to understand that the road ahead will not always be straight, will not always be smooth. In closing, I'd like to commend the SSI team for their steadfast commitment to ensuring that science makes a difference. 
Indeed, the ethos of SSI reflects one of my deepest beliefs, the importance of service to our society. The many faculty and students involved in SSI have committed themselves to a large goal, larger than themselves or their organization, a goal of helping to build a better world and a better state by building better communities. Based on my years of experience in public service, I believe that the long-term rewards of such work will more than outweigh the efforts involved. By articulating a common vision, by building broad-based partnerships, by focusing on the needs of society, and most of all, by be willing to listen, being willing to listen, to have patience, and respect those who disagree with us, they can make ours an even better place to live. My thanks to the University of Maine, to SSI, and all of the other contributing entities to this program. Thanks to you very much. Have a great day. We have time for a couple of questions, and Spencer and Mike, again, have microphones. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, right here. I was really moved by your comments about the importance of building trust and mutual respect in resolving conflict, and I wonder what wisdom you have to offer in regard to the current stalemate in the Congress. Um, <laughs> is that a situation that can be brought back to civility? Well, Bridie said we have a couple of minutes for questions. <laughs> that didn't leave any time for answers, uh, especially on a question of that significance, which is, uh, I think, difficult. Uh, I, I, I can't do the subject justice in just a brief comment. Uh, but I will say that uh, ours truly is a representative democracy. And in the end, the American people get the government that they want if they want it bad enough. I don't think, think things are going to change uh, unless and until the American people, in elections and otherwise, make clear their views. Uh, and I believe that uh, uh, while it is true that politics has always been rough in our country, there's a professor here at UMO, Amy Freed, who wrote an op-ed piece in the Bangor Daily News, I think it was last year, describing how rough and tumble the elect presidential election of 1800 was, and uh, I've cited that often. Uh, it's always been rough and tumble. It's never been very pleasant. I thought it was very tough when I was there, uh, but it's much rougher now. Uh, and there are a lot of factors. One is the dramatic increase in the amount of money involved in political campaigns and the huge effort that elected officials or those who run for election have to put into fundraising and how it so dominates our process. And the most important negative effect of that is that it has severed the bond of trust between the American people and their elected representatives, a bond of trust that is essential to the effective function of any democracy. I ask this question all over America to college, business, other groups. Does anybody here believe that members of Congress are more responsive to their constituents than they are to their contributors. Does anybody believe that? Not a hand. No, interestingly, only one person has ever raised her hand in all of America in the couple of years I've been asked that question. She jumped up and she said, well, I'm a, my husband's a member of the Congress, so I have to raise my hand. <laughs> uh, and that, if that's the case. The second is uh, this, uh, how we benefit greatly from technology in our lives. But technology is neutral and it can be used to produce negative results. And one manner is in 
the process of redrawing congressional districts. We've always had what's called gerrymandering. It's named after a Massachusetts politician shortly after the country was formed. After every census taken each 10 years, as required by the Constitution, lines of Congress are redrawn. The use of computers has enabled that gerrymandering process to now be much more precise and partisan than ever before. And it's engaged in all around, and there has to be a change to make that more like what the founders intended, a redrawing to reflect population changes, not to make aggressive changes in partisanship. So it, it, it has produced an, an anomalous result all around the country, and it's done every 10 years. I think we have to make that much, much uh, more nonpartisan and public. Uh, I think those two would go a long way, re figuring out a way to reduce the amount of money engaging in redistricting. The, the, the adverse effect of redistricting is very clear. There are 435 members of the House of Representatives. Fewer than 50 of them run in genuinely competitive districts. I can sit down here in a half hour and point out to you the 375 congressional districts in America where we know that the winner of the next election will be either a Republican or Democrat based upon the political composition of that district. That really isn't the way it should be. Uh, the redistricting ought to be done for the purpose of adjusting to changes in population, not meeting partisan goals. And, and the consequence of having uncontested seats is that the focus of decision, the point of which decisions may move from the general election to the primary election. And we all know we have sparse participation even in presidential campaigns, 50 to 60 percent, much less than that in congressional campaigns, and far, far less than that. A tiny fraction of the electorate participates in the nominating process. And that gives a hugely disproportionate role to the most active, most rigid, most ideological partisans on both sides with the result that people tend to get elected committed to a very small base of the public and not caring about the general election because they don't have anything to fear there. It, it produces a centrifugal, centrifugal effect away from the center rather than toward the center is what's healthy in most democratic societies. We have time for one more question. Right here. Oh. Thank you. Um, Senator, as a scientist, I was very struck by your words about how we need to make science and scientists more trustworthy. And of course, my first thought was, of course I'm trustworthy. Who wouldn't trust me? But I, I was wondering if you could push back, or I wanted to push back a little bit, or at least um, have you unpack that statement in terms of whether it's the scientists or the, sci the science that is untrustworthy, or it's whether people don't trust us. And those are, I think, two different things. Yeah. Well, I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, first off, uh, I'm not a scientist, but the human brain clearly operates in such a way that when we receive information that is consistent with our prior beliefs, we have very large receptors and it goes right into our mind and to our memory bank. But when we receive information that is contrary to our prior beliefs, the receptors are tiny, and it's forgotten very quickly. We are all predisposed in that way. We have to recognize and work hard to offset that bias. One of the things I've done in my political life is to actively search out contrary views. When I was in Northern Ireland, I used to solicit meetings with those who disagreed with me because I, I, I wanted better to understand the views because I was so naturally inclined to reject them. And most humans do find it hard to accept positions or views that disagree with us and they don't give them sufficient time and advice. That's not the fault of scientists. 
That's not the fault of science, but it is a reality that science and scientists must be aware of as they make their presentations in politics. The second is, it is also kind of human nature and a very unfortunate part of our makeup is that <clears throat> although not trying to be arrogant, we often act in an arrogant manner by being impatient with those who we think are not as knowledgeable as we are, are not as smart as we are, don't have as much insight or history or experience. And the more you know, the greater tendency to adopt that attitude. And I have to say to you frankly, uh, I, in my many years in the Senate, I was witness on occa many occasions in which scientists or other experts in fields displayed what I would call disdain or arrogance toward those who were less well informed. Well, just remember, trust is as important as expertise. And the way you get people to listen to and act upon your expertise is to get them first to trust that you respect them, that you are not here to tell them what to do, but rather to enable them to make up their minds in what you hope will be a correct manner. So I think it's a matter on, bo on both sides of having the right attitude, and most importantly of respect and trust, to open up the receptors so that they will take the information that you have and act upon it. Uh, that, that's, thank you all very much. Right. And I'd like to in invite David back up. Okay. So when I was trying to think of a way to thank Senator Mitchell for his strong support of SSI and the Mitchell Center, I was reminded of the story he, he's told before, he told today about growing up in Waterville in the long shadow of his older brothers who were outstanding athletes. In fact, uh, he says he developed a massive inferiority complex and that the only viable alternative for him in life was to pursue a career in politics. I was very sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> now, I don't want to take anything away from this powerful narrative, but I think it leaves out one important detail. In actual fact, Senator Mitchell is an accomplished athlete. Just a month ago, he won a major tennis doubles championship. This is a true story. Now, I'm not a sports expert, so I have no idea why you get international press coverage when you win a major tournament in Flushing Meadows, but when you barely get noticed when you win a major tournament on Mount Desert Island. <laughs> Personally, however, I think Senator Mitchell's tennis championship is just as deserving of recognition as when the Bryan brothers win a championship at the U.S. Open. So that's why my SSI colleagues and I have decided to induct Senator Mitchell into the SSI Hall of Fame. And George? You're going to use it as well. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say that I've seen a lot of abuses of the English language, uh, <laughs> but I, I've never seen one more than describing the tournament I won as a major tennis <laughs> doubles championship. Uh, uh, let me say that I won because I had a 45-year-old partner who is a great, great tennis player. And like almost everything in life, tennis, marriage, everything else, a good partner is integral to success. Thank you all very much. <laughs> you got a spider crawling on there. Did you notice that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Okay. On behalf of the Humane community and the entire SSI team, I just want to express again my appreciation to Dr. Lubchenko and Senator Mitchell for sharing their powerful visions and hopes for the future. I'm sure they've given us all great food for thought 
And speaking of food, I hope you can join us in the reception that will take place in the grand foyer of the Collins Center, less than about 100 yards from here. So once again, please join me in thanking both of them.